All right, if you open your Bibles this evening to Psalms 119, and the truth, ladies and gentlemen, is life is a veil of tears, and it's filled with trouble. That's all Bible. And uh, you're going to suffer, so you might as well suffer for Jesus Christ. <laughs> you might as well make your suffering worth it. And uh, if you don't live for Jesus Christ, the trials are not going to go away. <laughs> but at least if you're living with Him, you, you, you have Him with you. So praise the Lord. And my heart does go out. So a lot of those requests we heard this evening. And uh, that is the blessing to be able to take the time and take them up as a church family and hear what your brothers and sisters have on their heart and what they're going through. And again, please uh, take those lists you write and pray through them throughout the week. All right, so now we're going to start for several weeks uh, on Wednesday night just teaching on doctrine. Now, the word doctrine simply means teaching. And uh, so we're going to look at doctrine that's applicable to the New Testament, to the church. And none of these lessons are going to be exhausted. There'll probably be a week of peace on each subject. Uh, but it'll give you opportunity to get down a lot of the doctrines that we as New Testament Christians should know. And the verses to support them. And so I'd encourage you to take notes. I'd encourage you to write them down. I always encourage you to write in your Bible. That's why you have all that extra space there. And that's why you have blank pages in the front and in the back. You know, when we go over hell, just write hell and then start running the references. So then you have them in your Bible or heaven and run the references. You have them in your Bible. And uh, so we'll start this uh, mini series off tonight. I thought were appropriate to start would be uh, teaching on the doctrine of the Bible itself. And I know we just did a series in regards to like the history of the Bible and the manuscripts of that, but that's not the direction I'm going. It's just more or less of what the Bible says about itself and, and uh, um, kind of the, uh, what I believe is a, the important thing for you to grasp as a Christian. Now, I want to start off just with a couple technical terms, and I always like my preaching and teaching to be on a very uh, low level, and I don't mean that insulting anybody, but a level that anyone can understand. I don't believe in using all these theological words that some man made to make the, the preacher or the teacher look smart, and you go away thinking, what was he talking about? Uh, so, so I just want to define some of these terms for you in case you've heard of them before. But in regards to the Bible issue, you might have heard it called that we have or believe the verbal plenary inspiration of Scripture. And again, I just want to explain what that is because I agree with that statement. But what does that mean? <laughs> uh, so uh, again, it's basically comprised of three words there. The verbal plenary inspiration of Scripture. Now, the word verbal, when, when they're saying it in that sense, implies, and what I believe is the biblical understanding is, that means every word of the scripture was given to the writers, that's why it's verbal, that's their words, they were given to the writers, and not just merely the thoughts or idea. All right, so what I mean by that is when John penned his words, those words that he chose to write were directed by God. All right, so God's the one that gave them to John. God's the one that gave them to Paul and so on and so forth. Meaning it wasn't God's like, oh, I want you to write about this day and whatever comes to your mind, just write it. God directed them to write those words. And the Bible has internal proof, and that's why it complements each other and never contradicts each other. But God had those men pen those words. Now, what's amazing about that, God didn't change their personalities. God used the personalities. God used, you know, a fisherman and God used a, a, a king and God used different uh, people of different economic status. But in their vocabulary, in their how they would write, he made them write certain words that would line up with someone else who wrote totally different. And again, that's just God orchestrating the word of God. So that's what verbal implies. Again, it means God gave them the words of the Bible not just the thoughts of the Bible. You'll hear that often times in modern Christianity. Well, what does the Bible mean? And we'll talk more about that in a minute. Um, secondly is plenary. All right, the verbal, plenary. And that just simply means full or complete. Plenary means full or complete. Ladies and gentlemen, what that means is you have God's Word. <laughs> you know what that means? You have every bit of God's Word. And then obviously inspiration, there's, there, there's some technicality to inspiration, we'll look at that a little bit, but basically to summarize it is by the process of it was given, 
All right, it's given by inspiration. And uh, it's correlated, connected with the breath of God, the words of God, so on and so forth. But that's how God did it. Um, uh, so, again, when you hear someone say that we have the verbal, plenary, inspired scriptures, they're simply saying we have every word that God wants us to have because God's the one who gave them. That's what it means. That what you're reading is God's words. Now, I say this often, and I hope it doesn't come redundant, but it's true. Although there was over around 40 different author, uh, penners, there was one author, God Almighty. So that's what that means summed up. God used men to pen his word. And, you know, you get out there witnessing, and you'll probably experience it as you go out of these street ministries, or you go door knocking, you know, someone's going to be very profound, and they're going to stump you. And they're going to say, guess what? Did you know that man wrote the Bible? <laughs> and I'm always like, wow, newsflash, that's a revelation I never considered. Of course I know man wrote the Bible. Who else is going to write the Bible? It'd be, it'd be quite the miracle if a dog wrote the Bible. But no, a man does write a book. So yes, men wrote the Bible. But what we believe is that it was directed and given by God. These are God's words. All right, so now let's look here at a couple of references in regards to plenary. means full and complete. Look at Psalms 119. And we're just going to pick a few so we can push through on this. Psalms 119, look at verse 89. The Bible says there in Psalms 119, 89, Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Listen, that's a promise of God. You don't have to worry about if God has given us his word. You know, he said it's settled in heaven. Now, I understand it says in heaven, but God is not up in heaven sweating about his word. You know why? It's settled. It's done. It, the issue's over with God. It's settled in heaven. Now, with that said, go to uh, verse 160. 160. We know it's the word settled in heaven. Uh, now here in Psalms 119, 160. By the way, Psalms 119 is a wonderful chapter. The whole psalm, the whole chapter is about the word of God. It is a blessing. Look at verse 160. Thy word is true from the beginning. And every one of thy righteous judgments endureth forever. Listen to me, the Word of God is true from Genesis to Revelation. The Bible says it's, it's true from the beginning. You know why it's true from the beginning? Because it's settled in heaven. And, and again, it says there, the end part of that verse, and every one of thy righteous judgment endureth forever. You know how we can say we know that's true? Because we have God's Word. And it's true from the beginning and endureth forever. And it is settled now, again, there's, there's many other verses on it, but uh, again, just, just uh, keep in mind that we have the complete Bible. You know, again, Christians are always worried about, well, what about these missing books? And they found this, and they found that. Listen, don't worry about the missing books. Just read the book you do have. Your life will be consumed by reading these 66 books. Don't worry about the lost book of this and the lost book of that. God gave you His complete Word, and they're His words. And that's capital W-O-R-D-S. He's the Word, and He gave us the lowercase W-O-R-D-S. He gave us the words, because He is the Word. Now, we've been looking through this, so we'll just look at one. And as I've been showing you on Sundays, I believe the book of Isaiah is the internal proof that you have no missing books. Now, you all know this, because we're at what? Week... I don't know, we're on 50-something, high up there. I have 60, maybe. I don't know where we're at. What is this? This is 61, 62, something like that. But we've been looking at every week. But let me just show you again. And this one is remarkable. And maybe you remember this. It's been some weeks ago. But go to Isaiah 40. Isaiah 40. And we'll quickly just look at two of these. And we'll move on. Isaiah chapter 40. As I've explained this before when we went over this and I've taught on this before, when they study the book of Isaiah, 
and they study the first 39 chapters. And then they study chapters 40 through 66. The scholars, by using their own logic and own reason, no Bible, say there has to be two authors. And they come up with this thing called the deuteral or dual Isaiah theory, meaning it couldn't have been one author because there was such a drastic change at chapter 40 through 66. Chapters 1 through 39 were written with a certain style, a certain manner. Chapters 40 through 66 were written, written with a different style, a different manner. Therefore, it had to be a different author. What they miss is the blessing that God was trying to show them that it was one author. But there was a drastic change because the 40th book of your Bible is the book of Matthew. And that's when the Lord Jesus Christ shows up. Now look at Isaiah 40. Look at verse 3. Look at Isaiah 40. Now watch this. This will blow you away if you've never seen this. Isaiah 40, look at verse 3. The Bible says, The voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Guess where you find that reference at? You find that in Matthew chapter 3, verse 3, which is the 40th book of the New Testament, and it is speaking of John the Baptist who shows up. Amen. And again, that's an internal proof that the book of Isaiah matches the Bible. It has 66 chapters in it, and your Bible has 66 books in it. And so God's not trying to show you there was two, two uh, different authors. God's trying to show you this is the start of the New Testament. Now we know, because you know we've studied this, technically the New Testament doesn't start to the death of the testator, but it's the start of the life of Jesus Christ, and in that book he does die, right? So it's his life, and that is the transition, that is the change. It's from Old Testament to New Testament. Now again, I know all about the chapter marks, I know all about the verse marks, but what are the odds that you could go to Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3, and it would match Matthew chapter 3, verse 3, talking about John the Baptist. Only God could do that. So you have God's Word. Look at uh, Isaiah 66. Isaiah 66. Obviously, this is an easy one to figure out. The 66th book of the Bible is the book of Revelation. It is the last book. And guess what we're going to read in Isaiah chapter 66? Let's just pick up a little bit of context. Look at verse 21. Isaiah 66, 21, I will also... Take of them for the priests and for the Levites, saith the Lord. Watch it, verse 22. For as the new heavens and the new earth, which I will make, shall remain before me, saith the Lord. So shall your seed and your name remain. So there you go. You know what you have in Revelation 21 and Revelation chapter 22? You have the new heaven and the new earth. Just like it lines up here in Isaiah chapter 66, which would match the 66th book of the Bible, which is the book of Revelation. Again, coincidence? I, I trow not. <laughs> I think not. Uh, again, why would the last chapter of Isaiah speak of the new heavens and new earth? God's pointing to you that this is a connection. You don't have to worry about any missing books. You have His complete Word. Every bit of it. It's true from the beginning. All right, secondly, let's talk a little bit, again, just about verbal inspiration. Again, that means the words were given to the writers, how? By inspiration and not just the ideas. Let me show you, according to the Bible, look at 2 Peter, 2 Peter chapter 1. Again, so what we're doing is we're studying the Bible, uh, about what the Bible says about itself. And ladies and gentlemen, it's important, if you're going to be a Christian, that you have your final authority not in a church, that your final authority is not in a man, that your final authority is in the Word of God. These are His words. And that ought to be where your confidence is in. While you're turning there to uh, Second Peter there, I've I seen it made news, and I have no idea who the gentleman is, but 
I guess he was a pretty influential and famous author, I guess. He wrote that book, Kissing Courtship Goodbye. And now he's kissed his marriage goodbye after 20 years. And now he's uh, uh, kissed his Christian faith goodbye. A lot of Christians are troubled by that. Why? Now, now, granted, it should grieve our soul anytime someone falls away. But it should not shake your faith a bit. Because my faith is not in a man. My faith is in the Word of God. And that's what it, yeah, amen. All right, 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1. Watch here. Oh, let's just back up. This is, I, I want to show you something here. Go back to verse 17, and we'll get to the point here in a minute, but I want to show you something. Look at verse 17. It says, For he received from God the Father honor and glory when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. That's when the Father spoke. Remember that. Now look what it says here in verse 18. And this voice which came from heaven we heard, that's Peter right in there, when we were with him in the holy mount. Watch it now, verse 19. We have also a more sure word of prophecy. What do we have a more sure word of prophecy than? We have a more sure word of prophecy than if we were to hear with our ears God the Father speak from heaven. That's profound. We have a more sure word of prophecy than what Peter heard. Keep reading there. Where unto you do well that you take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your heart. Here we go. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. Let me just make a comment there. I hear people all the time say, well, that's just your interpretation. That might be so, but guess what? When you don't agree with me, that's your interpretation. Now, here's the truth. Well, there's a couple truths here. Either I'm right and you're wrong, or you're wrong and I'm right, or we're both wrong. <laughs> but that doesn't change the fact that there is a truth. People make that statement trying to say, well, there's no truth. That's not what the Bible teaches. There is a truth. There's just no private interpretation of it. There's one truth. Now keep reading. Watch verse 21. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of men, but holy men of God spake, watch it, as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. It wasn't by their will. It wasn't by their intellect. It wasn't by their words. They were moved by the Holy Ghost. And they spake and they preached. And you know what oftentimes happened? Someone recorded <laughs> and someone wrote down what they said. And that's how we come about to get the Word of God. You can write this reference down, but I want you to turn. We're gonna, you guys can go ahead and turn to Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4. If you're taking notes, write down Ezekiel chapter 3, verse 4. All right, so write down Ezekiel 3, verse 4. And I want you to, for time's sake, to turn to Matthew chapter 4. Now, Ezekiel chapter 3, verse 4 says this, And he said unto me, that's God speaking, Son of man, go, get thee unto the house of Israel. Now listen, and speak with my words unto them. God told the Son of Man there, Ezekiel, he said, speak with my my words unto them. Again, what I'm showing you and making the connection is that these men were moved by the Holy Ghost. Guess what they were speaking? God's words, not their words. All right, now look here in Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4. You understand the story here in Matthew chapter 4. This is the temptation of the Lord Jesus Christ. He had just been done fasting and praying. The devil comes to him. Let's just read a little context. Look at verse 1. Then, he then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterwards a hungered. 
When the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. Now watch this in verse 4, Matthew 4, 4. But he answered and said, watch it, it is written. He's referring to the scripture. He's referring to something that's written down. It is written. Here we go. Man shall not live by bread alone. Watch it. But by every word, that's what is written, that proceedeth out of what? Out of the mouth of God. You know what was written? The words that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Again, it's showing you the scripture is God's words. And those are his words that come forth out of his mouth. And it came about when the Holy Ghost moved upon those men and they spake. Those were his words. Look at John chapter 6. John chapter 6. The reason you should be encouraged by this, this is where your power comes from, Christian. Your power doesn't come from your intellect. Your power doesn't come from uh, how much you know or don't know. Your power comes from the Word of God because they are God's words. John chapter 6. The Lord Jesus Christ just gives the disciples and all those in attendance one of the hardest sayings in all the Bible. <laughs> After he gives them this hard saying, guess what happens in John 6, 66? You have 666, and the disciples are tried by a hard saying. Look what it says there. From that time, many of the disciples went back and walked no more with him because of a hard saying. But look at the response when the Lord talked to them previously or what he was trying to tell them. Because the whole story, if you remember there, he said, you've got to eat my flesh and drink my blood. And they're like, wow, this is bizarre. You know, we've been following this guy. He's lost it. He's went off the deep end. I'm leaving. <laughs> That's what's going on. They don't understand. But look what he says here in verse 63. He says, it is the spirit that quickeneth the flesh profiteth nothing. He's saying, ladies and gentlemen, I'm not talking physically. I'm not saying you got to physically eat my flesh and physically drink my blood. That's forbidden by the Bible. The words I speak unto you, they're, they're spiritual, they're spirit. Look what he says there, the rest of the verse. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. So here's what I want you to take away. When we talk about the verbal inspiration, that is God's words that proceed out of his mouth, and they are spiritual words. And guess what they do? They give life. So Christian, what we need to do is go forth and tell this word, world what? The words of God. And we have them, praise the Lord for that. All right. Let's look just for a, a, a few moments here. I think I'm about out of time on what the Bible says about inspiration. 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3. Second Timothy chapter 3. And uh, look at verse 16. All right, the Bible says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Again, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. Let me ask you a question this, this evening, ladies and gentlemen. Do you have Scripture? If you have scripture, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. That means if you have scripture, it was given by inspiration of God. Now, if you don't have scripture, then you don't have God's inspired word. But we have the scripture. Now, the word inspiration uh, only shows up, I believe it's one other time in the Bible. Look at Job chapter 32, and we're going to have to quit here. So, I made myself a liar. And I'm going to have to teach two weeks on this subject. 
Job chapter 32. I would keep going, but we got institute after this. So we'll, we'll close out here and we'll pick up. Job chapter 32. Now remember, 2 Timothy 3, 16, the Bible says all scripture is given by inspiration of God. Job chapter 32. Watch it carefully. The Bible says in verse 8, but there is a spirit in a man. Watch it. And the inspiration of the Almighty giveth them understanding. So there's a spirit inside of a man. And the inspiration of the Almighty giveth understanding. And is connected to our spirit. And once you find out where understanding comes from, it's clear we're going to run the reference. The understanding comes from what? His words. In his words, he then takes your spirit and gives you understanding, and that is the inspiration of God. And God, so you say, what are you saying, preacher? I'm saying there is a spiritual transaction that takes place inside a saved believer. When they read the word of God, when they listen to the word of God, there's inspiration that's taking place to give you understanding. Who's that coming from? The Almighty. And that makes sense because if you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 2, that's why the Bible says the natural man, he can't discern the things of God. But we can because we have his spirit and we have his word. And through his word, inspiration takes place and we get understanding from God. And again, it's all connected with the spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, because he is the one who teaches us, right? According to Jesus Christ, he's going to lead us into all truth. And that happens through that transaction of inspiration. He gives us understanding from the Almighty. So we'll pick up there next uh, week. And actually it won't be next week because I won't be here, but the week after. And we'll pick up there. And we're going to conclude with this thought of inspiration. And then we're going to talk about preservation and translation. Because those are two important issues in regards to the Word of God. So we'll pick up on inspiration. I'm sorry. Uh, on preservation and translation. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for the night you've given us. We thank you for the word of God. We thank you that we have a rich treasure that's came down from above. We have that bread, that manna, uh, Lord, that you sent down from heaven. We're thankful for it. Lord, I pray you give us a heart for the word of God. I pray that you would uh, just stir our hearts to learn more about it, that we'd engulf ourselves, we'd meditate upon your precepts. And Lord, we need understanding from the Almighty. We love you. We thank you. Pray that you get the honor and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You are dismissed.